welcome sue to healing miracles and what we're going to discuss i know you're going to add a lot to it thank you john it's nice to be here with you today thank you what is your trade what profession are you in i've been a registered nurse for over thirty years and i take care of children both in the hospital setting in the home setting with special needs so you've been working with children for a long time and you love children i do love children john i do they're wonderful and isn't it hard to believe that this would be happening in today's society it is and i was not aware until recently about how much it really is happening the pro choice movement says it's only done to women who it's affecting their health and that's a lie that's a lie this is a choice that any woman can make and any abortionist can make however no hospital in this country performs partial birth abortions it's always done in abortion clinics do you think that women are aware of what they're going to go through or what the baby's going to go through when they make that choice i don't think they are i think they're thinking of themselves and the future and they don't want this burden of a child um, it takes three days to perform a partial birth abortion three days there's two days of prep before the abortion itself oh. and it's a very painful procedure for the woman and, and I'm sure they're not aware of all that no no it's terrible that's awful let me put it this way I don't believe the average American person really knows what's going on and they they don't really care to know because it's unpleasant it is unpleasant and that's why I think this is so important to get out because I think it's time that the Christians got their heads out of the sand and really took a stand on this because it is a very critical issue amen God knows these miracles that are coming and they not one of them is a mistake and we just need to protect these children Joan yes I agree so let's uh, without any further hesitation let's show this tape we have about a 15 minute videotape we'd like to share and we want to thank the people that took the time and cared enough to create this tape so that people really could see the true facts this isn't pleasant to watch but it needs to be watched John so that people will understand what's going on out there yes we may add to that maybe uh, uh, a child under 14 would you say shouldn't it should this? leave the room now yeah. yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay let's show that tape okay. This procedure crosses the line between abortion and infanticide. Many Americans have no idea how far things have gone in this country. They had no idea that the law even permitted something as grotesque as partial birth abortion. No woman should ever be subject to this, this procedure. It's just a cruelty. I wanted to pick one of those little feet up and show it to the mother and say, look what you just did. I said, God, why are you letting this happen? Why? Why does this have to happen? This is murder. Behind the marble white columns of our nation's highest court, a single gavel falls across the American soil, sending the certain sounds of God's judgment upon its inhabitants. Partial birth abortion is now the law of our land. What the court has said is that the right of a woman to an abortion means the right of a woman to a dead baby, irrespective of the procedure being used. Under the doctrine of the Supreme Court, a living, just delivered baby, no matter how premature, is a person under the Constitution. In other words, no one can second guess the opinion of the doctor in this case. So if the doctor says this is the best interest of the woman's health, irrespective of whether the AMA, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, every other medical school, every other certified organization in the country says that this is not a safe procedure, it doesn't matter. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, 
that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No hospital does this procedure, none. There are no hospitals that do partial birth. There is no text that treats, uh, that, that treats this as a legitimate procedure, that teaches this procedure in any medical school or any kind of, uh, of training of, of obstetricians uh, to do abortion. This is a procedure only done for the convenience of the abortionist and only done at abortion clinics who do second and third trimester abortions. Five Supreme Court justices passed sentence on their unseen enemy and marked a dark day in the course of human history. So what you have here is a rogue procedure with rogue doctors who have no qualifications as experts, but the court gives them the supreme rule and gives them all of the 100% discretion as to whether this is in the best interest, irrespective of what the medical evidence is. And in fact, the court goes a long way to say it doesn't really matter. In an effort to stem the tide of such an unconscionable act, Senator Rick Santorum has recently authored and sponsored legislation to stop the tidal wave of abortion in our nation. My God. Appendicitis. That's not an appendix. That's not a blob of tissue. It is a baby. It's a baby. Can the liberties of a nation be sure when we remove their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated but with his wrath? Partial birth abortion procedure is performed mostly in the fifth and the sixth months of pregnancy, sometimes later, sometimes in the seventh month or even later than that. This is a medical model of a baby at four and a half months, 20 weeks. This is the earliest stage at which a partial birth abortion which would generally be done. So this is the smallest the baby would be who is a victim of a partial birth abortion. Many are much larger. This uh, procedure is different than other abortion procedures that are done uh, later in pregnancy uh, because the baby is delivered, in a sense. The partial birth abortion procedure was described in this paper by Ohio abortionist Dr. Martin Haskell, written in 1992. It describes step by step how this type of an abortion is performed. We had these drawings done which depict in visual form what is described in the paper. In the first stage of the procedure, the abortionist is actually watching the baby on a TV screen using an ultrasound machine. This allows the abortionist to reach in with forceps and grab the baby, usually by a leg, turn the baby around, and begin to deliver the baby, while still alive, into the birth canal. At a certain point, the abortionist is able to grab the baby with his hands and continue to deliver, deliver the baby into the birth canal uh, everything except for the head. In this procedure, it is very important that the head not emerge from the womb because that, of course, would be a live birth under the law. So the doctor actually grips the baby in a certain way described in the paper to ensure that the head does not emerge as well as the body. Then at the point where the entire baby has been delivered alive into the birth canal except for the head, the doctor takes a long surgical scissor, such as this one, or some other similar medical device, and thrusts it through the base of the baby's skull, as shown in drawing number four. This is generally what kills the baby. He removes the scissors, or the other puncturing instrument, and he inserts a tube, or a catheter. This tube is connected to a very powerful suction machine, which, when he turns it on, removes the baby's brain. This causes the skull to collapse, and the baby's head then emerges, completing the delivery of the dead baby. In a day and age of great technological advancements, we as a nation under God find ourselves confronted with a judicial decision that literally destroyed the very foundations of life in our country. Congressman J.C. Watts shares his views and those of his colleagues from the halls of Congress on the Supreme Court ruling on partial birth abortion legalizing infanticide. 
We have just created this cavalier approach uh, to this precious thing that God has given us called, uh, called life. And now we've fine-tuned it to say that uh, it's even okay to allow a child to, to be drawn down its mother's womb until you see the head and use this brutal medical procedure called partial birth abortion to kill that child. And, and I, I, I just am deeply concerned that America would sign off on that. It's time to awaken the moral conscience of a nation and the sleeping giant of the church to respond with one voice against the crumbling tide of moral, ethical, and spiritual decline in America. The voice of those who cannot speak is being heard on Capitol Hill as the terrible act of partial birth abortion is brought before Congress to enact a legislative ban. Those five times that we voted on it, the president has vetoed it uh, each time, uh, uh, which is unfortunate. I think Patrick Moynihan says it, uh, says it best. Uh, it's infanticide. Uh, it is a brutal, uh, immoral procedure that uh, we allow in the greatest nation in all the world to take place. Anything we do, I think we have to ask ourselves, uh, is it constitutional? But I think we also have the obligation and the responsibility to ask ourselves, is it right? Partial birth abortion is wrong. It is infanticide. Well, I'm a nurse. I've had 15 years of experience in the nursing field. I've done just about every type of nursing you can imagine, from hospital, nursing home, emergency room, surgery, clinics, uh, home care for a long time. And I was actually working for a nursing agency at the time, and they staff all those different types of, types of facilities. They called me up one day and asked me if I would work at the Women's Medical Center. And I told them I would, because I didn't have a problem with abortion, or at least I didn't think I did. So I went into the clinic for three days of orientation with the understanding if everything worked out okay, I'd be hired by this doctor. And it was a full-time position that was opening up, and I was only working part-time at the time. So I was very excited about the job until I went in there. The first day I was there, the doctor does what's called DNC abortions. This is an abortion bed on babies from about five to 10 weeks of pregnancy. He wanted me to watch every single procedure, so I stood right beside him to let me know what was going on. He wanted me to know everything. So I did. This DNC procedure, we brought the women into the operating room. He has two of them. And we prepped her. We put her gown on her and put her on the table, put her legs in the stirrups. And the doctor goes in with a suction catheter, literally, and goes up inside her uterus and suctions out the contents. It was very bloody. I couldn't see a lot. It all went down a tube and into a jar. One particular thing that really stood out in my mind that first day was the 15-year-old girl in there having her third abortion. And she laughed the whole way through it. It wasn't a big deal to her. It was just something she did. Unfortunately, a lot of these girls use abortion as their only means of birth control. And the sad thing is her parents didn't even know she was there. Didn't have to have permission, didn't have to even have notification. She just was there with her boyfriend. They also on that first day did the prep work for the partial birth abortion because it is a three-day procedure. What they have to do is mechanically and forcefully dilate that woman's cervix. Of course, the cervix is the mouth of the womb, and the womb's where the baby's kept. And they do this with um, the rods. First of all, they use metal rods to mechanically dilate it, go in and force open the mouth of that cervix a little bit to where they can get these dilators in called laminaria. It's a seaweed-based product that looks like a tampon with a string on it. The doctor puts in about five to 10 of these that first day, depends on the woman. When it gets wet, it swells, and it forces open that mouth, that cervix, forcing it to come open so you can get the baby out. He sends her home or to a local motel, she's not from around the area, with pain pills, an emergency number if anything happens. And the next day, she comes back, we bring her in, and we remove the lemon area that he had put there the day before, and this time he puts in 15 to 25 of them, depending on the woman, and sends her home again. And I went home that night, and I didn't know if I could go back that third day or not, because they told me somewhat what they were going to do with this next procedure. But I went back, I don't know if it was out of pride of trying to, you know, stick out the assignment, 
trying to, uh, not wanting to admit that I was less than a professional I was, or maybe even God sent me back in there, even though probably it was one of the worst days of my life. I did go back, and on that third day, they did what's known as the partial birth abortion procedure. The first lady we did was 26 and a half weeks pregnant. She had just found out that her baby had Down syndrome, and her parents and her boyfriend made her get this abortion. She didn't want it. As a matter of fact, she cried the entire three days she was in there. So we did her first because she was upsetting the rest of the patients. And we brought her into the operating room and put the gown on her, put her on the table, put her legs in the stirrups. And we started an IV and gave her Valium just to calm her down so she wouldn't care what was going on. She didn't get a general anesthetic to knock her out. And I really thought those babies were dead at this point. I thought, they're not gonna do this on a live baby, surely. You know, something's killed the baby. I don't know what I thought killed it, but they were very much alive and you could see the heartbeat. As a matter of fact, they even asked the doctor. I saw the heartbeat and I said, well, what's that? And he said, it's a heartbeat. Oh, okay. So he had me standing there, probably three feet from the baby, just so I wouldn't contaminate the sterile field. And taking a pair of forceps, he went up inside the cervix and into the uterus and found one of the baby's feet and turned the baby in utero because it wasn't headed feet first. He has to bring the baby out feet first. So he brought that foot down through the birth canal. Then he went up and he grabbed the other foot and he brought it down through the birth canal until he had both of the feet on the outside. And grabbing his little feet with his hands, he pulled the baby out of the mother for each position until he had the entire body, everything delivered except for the head. And as I stood there, this little baby was kicking his feet and moving his little hands and fingers and very much alive. And the doctor's very careful to make sure that he holds the baby's head in with his two fingers, with his left hand, to make sure that that head doesn't slip out. Because if the head slips out now, three inches, three seconds from being born and he kills it, it's murder. As long as he leaves that head in there, and he's very careful to make sure that head stays there. It, it doesn't matter how he kills it. It's an abortion and it's legal in this country. And as I stood there in horror, I watched this. The doctor took a pair of scissors and into the back of the baby's neck, back here, he plunged those scissors. And when he did this, the baby jerked out in a startle reaction. And he took the scissors and he opened it up to make a hole in the back of the neck. And he took a high-powered suction machine and a catheter, and he stuck that into the hole, and he literally suctioned out the baby's brain. And he went down the tube and into a jar. And I almost hit the floor. I mean, I stood there, and I thought, this isn't happening. This really isn't happening. I'm dreaming this. Please, wake me up. And I choked back the tears and the lump in my throat. And I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. I didn't want to be in there, but it, but it happened. He pulled the head out and he cut the cord and he delivered the placenta and threw it in the pan. And he cleaned her up and he took the baby out of the room. And this mom wanted to see her baby. We tried to talk her out of it, but she does have the right to see it. So we cleaned her up and put a pad on her and walked her to the ultrasound machine room. And we cleaned the baby up and put it in a little blanket and we handed it to her. And I don't know what she thought she was going to see. But I don't think it's what she saw because she looked down in his little face and she started screaming to God to forgive her. That was, that was quite a, a film and it wasn't a pleasant one, but it's something that needed to be heard and said. And I, I just hope that it reached somebody out there, even if it reached and touched one person that's, that's contemplating one. having an abortion, that's right. especially um, this partial birth abortion, which is done in the last stages of the uh, pregnancy. Uh, I, I'm going to give a number. Uh, someone out there needs to talk to somebody. You're, you're thinking of changing your mind about an abortion, or you're just thinking about it, and you've been considering it. I'd like you to call. She works with lots of women in lots of different situations. And she's a, a young lady. She's probably about uh, 32 or three years old. And she is uh, just uh, a very loving, compassionate person and a very understanding person. And whatever you want to keep confidential, she will keep confidential. 
let's just discuss a little bit before we go on um, about what the abortion does to a woman's body. Well, Joan, this uh, partial birth abortion especially weakens the cer cervical muscle. And so if she should choose that she wants to have a child later in life, that muscle is weakened and the weight of the baby as it's developing in the womb will cause pressure on that and she can have a miscarriage. And miscarriages are quite frequent uh, with these women that have had these partial birth abortions. So any pregnancy that she might really be looking forward to later in life might not happen. As well as there's an emotional strain and a guilt that these women will live with the rest of their lives because there's no way about it. They know that that's a life and as they're going through that procedure, those babies are moving and uh, they are suffering pain. And these women have to live with that and it's not something that any woman should have to go through life living with because they had made a mistake earlier in life. Yes, I know. I, I just wonder how many women would actually go through with the abortion if they knew what was coming, what was ahead of them, emotionally as well as... Right, and I think that's why it's so important for them to talk to somebody, yes. somebody that's been through that's it, honest. and that is honest mm -hmm. and willing to tell them, this is not just a simple procedure that you go through and it's over with, because you carry it with you for the rest of your life. That's right, that's so true. Well, God, God just takes those little ones back home. He does. You know, and, and He loves them. And, Praise God, he is a God worthy to be praised and, and he's a loving God. And if he gives these, he gives women, people, parents, wonder, a wonderful miracle, as you said earlier, a gift. And for them to abuse it like that is, is such, it's so wrong. And of course, we know, all know it's a sin. I just wanted to read a little bit out of um, the Bible where it talks about how God has known us before we've come into the That's world. Right. He created us, and it's in Psalm 139. I know a lot of people are familiar with this, but there are always people out there that it's always good don't to hear read it again the Bible. Too. It's <laughs> always good to hear it again. So I'm just going to read parts of it in Psalm 139, where it says, starting with verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You compensate my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. And then, as we skip ahead a little bit, it says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. And you skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance yet being formed. And in your book they were all written. The days fashioned for me. And how precious also are your thoughts to me, Lord. How great is the sum of them. God is such a loving, loving God. And before, I, I, I want to talk a little bit Sue, about what you're doing now. But before we do that, I want to show you what a healthy, wonderful baby, a loved baby, looks like. <laughs> and here, here, here come two beautiful children. This is Shane Alexander, and he is six weeks old, and his mother, Angela. And this is his big brother, Austin. Come on over here, Austin. One minute, so it's on the screen. Oh, Austin. Oh. Oh, you love your little brother? <laughs> we have to just touch really quick on, on if you just want to keep the children here a minute. Oh, okay, sure. We're almost over with the program. So. And Sue, I want to thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. And we've learned a lot today, haven't we? We have. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, God. My name is Darlene, and I am so excited to tell you about the Healing Miracles Anointed Prayer Book. A few years ago, the Holy Spirit told the hostess and co-producer of the Healing Miracles TV program, Joan Abel, to put together a book of prayers. The result was this beautiful anointed prayer book. Not a single prayer became a part of this book until the Holy Spirit gave His approval. There are over 90 prayers and illustrations in this book 
covering almost every conceivable subject. The book starts out with prayers of encouragement. Let me remind you of John 14:14, 14, 14, which reads, Whatever you ask in the name of Jesus Christ, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The second book of Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14. Prayers on finances and prosperity, including prayers for employment, for God's favor and knowing God's will. A chapter on health and healing. Psalm 118. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Marriage prayers, intercessory prayers for your spouse. Prayers on renewing the mind, watching what you say. Words are powerful and they can determine your future. It's conquering your thought life, overcoming worry and stress. So, let go and let God. The Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, intercessory prayers of salvation. We can intercede for our friends and our family by praying these powerful prayers for their salvation. All the prayers in this book are very, very powerful. And remember, this book was inspired by the Holy Spirit. The book ends with an illustration of how much God our Father, Yeshua, loves us. And if you need a miracle, you need to be praying these prayers. This wonderful, anointed prayer book can be yours. Thank you, and remember, our God is a God of healing miracles.